I want you to take your Bible and turn to John chapter 6. And this is now the sixth week we have been in John chapter 6. This is a magnificent chapter in John's Gospel. And we're in the last section of John chapter 6. And we'll finish this, I'm pretty sure, next Sunday morning. But this morning we're going to see the marks of a true disciple. This chapter begins with 20,000 people following Jesus. And it ends with almost the same number of people defecting from Jesus. And we spent the last three weeks dissecting why 20,000 people would initially follow Jesus for a variety of reasons, and then, at the end of the chapter, why they would leave Jesus in the space of one chapter. We saw seven reasons why people follow Jesus for the wrong reasons, then those were the marks of a false disciple. And we saw that there are also the reasons why some people come to church for one or more of those seven wrong reasons and why people eventually defect from following Jesus. For example, some of them came because of the crowd. Some of them came because they were seeking the sensational. Some had their own agendas. Some just wanted to get their physical needs met. Some were after sensational power that Jesus was demonstrating so that they too could demonstrate that same power. And, and then some just simply didn't understand what Jesus was talking about. And then their bubble burst in verse 41 of John 6. And in verse 41 it says, So the Jews grumbled about Jesus because Jesus said. Now notice, their bubble burst because of what Jesus said. Because of his words. Their bubble burst not because of Jesus' works, but because of his words. Jesus was killed because of his words, not his works. And we'll come back to that in a minute. I can't imagine the pain that our Lord Jesus must have suffered in John chapter 6 over the defection of these 20,000 disciples. Because I do know in some small measure the difficult reality of ministry. Biblical ministry, gospel ministry, certainly pastoral ministry, has, has a sadness to it that never goes away. And frankly, it accumulates the, the longer you do it. And, and it is heartbreaking reality that people come and they hear and they stay for a while and some actually profess Jesus and then they eventually turn their back on Jesus and eternal life and then slide back into their old life. It is the most painful of all spiritual experiences for a pastor and for those who love Christ and those who love the church. It is the most discouraging of all. Not just because you don't get a return on the investment that you made in people's lives. Not because they forsake the preacher. Not because they forsake the people. But because they forsake the Lord. They, they step over Him like a doormat. Even though He's their only hope of salvation. He's their only hope of getting to heaven. It's very, very serious. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 29 says, How much worse punishment will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant. Very, very serious. To follow the Lord and then turn your back on Him. The defection of false disciples is heartbreaking. But now the chapter changes direction. Jesus Focus changes from the defectors to the committed, to true disciples. And so let's turn our attention now, in this last part of the chapter, to the marks of a true disciple. 
Look at verse 35. We'll begin this section with the words that turn the false disciples off. Verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall never hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. The first mark of a true disciple is that they believe the words of Jesus. The false disciples don't believe Jesus' words. Look at verse 36. But I say to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. And verse 60 proves that Jesus is right. Because the false disciples say, this is a hard teaching. Who was able to listen to it? Doesn't say who was able to understand it. Doesn't say who was able to hear it. It says who was able to listen to it. In other words, they're covering their ears to say, this is such hard teaching, we don't even want to hear it. It's so disheartening for a preacher to preach and for people to reject what he's saying. But notice the way Jesus handles it in verse 37. All that the Father is going to give to me is going to come to me. In other words, Jesus knows that people believe in Jesus because God the Father enables them to believe. In other words, Jesus handles this mass defection of 20,000 people by leaning heavily on the sovereignty of God. The sovereign electing will of the Father. Look what Jesus says. Whoever God chooses will come. That's the only way to stay encouraged in the ministry. When you get discouraged. And when things seem to be going badly. And when people defect and walk away. The only way to persevere through that is to lean heavily on the sovereignty of God and remember that God is the one who draws people. He is the one who is in control. He is the one that produces results, not the preacher. And notice what it says, once they believe, Jesus says, once they believe, they will always believe. Look what Jesus says, whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Verse 38. <coughs> For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Verse 39. This is the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me. But I will raise it up at the last day. In other words, there's so much meat in this little section. Nobody who really believes will ever be lost. Because God's will is never frustrated. In other words, God always gets what He wants. God always gets His way. And nobody that God calls will not come. And when they do come, they will never be lost. Notice what Jesus says. When they believe, they will have eternal life. Verse 40. This is the will of my Father, that everybody who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life. And I will raise Him up at the last day. And Jesus says it again in verse 47. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. So all you have to do to get eternal life, all you have to do to get heaven, is to believe in the words of Jesus Christ. Just trust the words of Christ. That's Jesus says that. Now lest you're wondering, don't I have to be a good person to get to heaven? Isn't morality the standard to get into heaven? Well, look at verse 63. Jesus says, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh, your flesh, my flesh, your earthly works, are of no help at all to get to heaven. You cannot work your way to heaven. The gospel is God-centered. Heaven 
belongs to God. So God sovereignly decides because of his own will, because of his own good pleasure, who God wants to go there. And God chooses who he wants to go there. And God gets what he wants. And God calls and God elects. God grants eternal life to whoever he wants. And God sustains and keeps whoever he calls so that nobody that he calls is lost. Well, that gets a lot of people mad. No wonder they get mad. I mean, this is offensive. Nothing gets people as angry as the sovereign electing work of God. How dare God decide who goes to heaven? A man-centered theology thinks that man decides who goes to heaven, not God. But Jesus teaches a, a God-centered theology of the gospel. However, you and I still have a responsibility to believe. But how can that be? How, how can God sovereignly elect whoever he wants to go to heaven, and at the same time, I am responsible to believe? Which is it? Well, I don't really know how to explain that. Because the Bible doesn't really explain it. When we get to heaven, we'll know. But here's what I do know. If you don't know Jesus Christ this morning, the fact that you are here today, listening to this sermon, paying attention to this sermon, is no accident. God is probably calling you to heaven. If you don't know much about this, this is the first time you're hearing this, and you need to know more, all you have to do is ask him. Jesus says, ask and you will receive. And if you, if you want clarity and you need clarity, that's a really good sign that you're probably elected. Or, or maybe you're here this morning and you believed in Christ a long time ago and you're struggling this morning and you're doubting and you're wondering if it's all true and you're, you're not even sure this morning if you're really saved. The fact that you're worried about these things is evidence that you're probably called, that you're chosen. What you need to do is get yourself more rooted in the Word. Because that will give you stability and strength and assurance and confidence that you're really headed home to heaven. But there's one more thing about belief that you need to see here. Look at verse 41. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Verse 42, they said, is, the, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? How could this be? They, they don't understand it, so they don't believe. They're rejecting Christ. This is the beginning of their defection. They're falling away. They're not at the end of the chapter yet. They haven't fallen away yet, but this is the beginning of it. They're grumbling. They're not asking for help. They're not asking for illumination. They're belligerent. They're hostile. That's how you know when somebody probably isn't elected. Because there is an ongoing hostility towards Christ. There's no ask. There's no wanting truth. There's no search for truth. There's just a belligerent hostility towards Christ and towards Scripture. A cynicism, a skepticism, and an, and an absence of, of searching for the answers and for truth. Look at verse 43. Jesus answered them, Do not grumble among yourselves. Verse 44. Nobody can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. This is the same statement as verse 37, only it's from the other side. All that the Father gives will come. That's what it says in verse 37. Here it says nobody can come unless the Father draws him. 
In other words, you cannot believe without divine help. If you have ever wondered why God hasn't saved one of your loved ones yet, imagine what it must have been like for Jesus in his humanity when he preached to 20,000 people and virtually none of them believed because the Father hadn't drawn them. People who grumble about Jesus' words and grumble about the Word of God simply cannot believe because the Father is not drawing them. He makes the same point in the next verse. And I will raise him up on the last day, verse 45. It is written in the prophets, <coughs> they will all be taught by God. You cannot understand the scripture without God's help. Everybody who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. You can only believe if God enables you to believe. Verse 48, not that anybody has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father, speaking of himself. In other words, you can believe me. I know what I'm talking about. I come from heaven. I come from the Father. You can take my word for it. I don't believe this book because I'm particularly smart or intelligent. I believe this book for one very simple reason. God has enabled me to believe it. God has enabled me to accept it. God has enabled me to understand it. The Holy Spirit at work in my life has opened my eyes and illuminated my heart to be able to understand this word and to understand Christ and that that's what caused me to bow the knee and surrender to Christ and for the last 30 some years has caused me to want to follow him more than anyone else in the world. He means more to me than anything in the world. That's only because of the work of the Spirit in my life. I cannot believe this, understand this, accept this, without his divine help. Now one more word about belief. Real belief ingests Jesus' words. It doesn't simply believe them, but it, it ingests them. Look at verse 48. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. That's a reference to the Old Testament story of the Israelites eating manna in the desert for 40 years. They ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. Verse 50. This is the true bread that comes down from heaven. So in other words, that Old Testament story was an analogy of the real bread of life, Jesus, so that one may eat of it and not die. Verse 51, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anybody eats of this bread, he will live forever. Now, what on earth is Jesus talking about? This is a very simple analogy. Jewish rabbis of the day used analogies to teach spiritual truth from everyday uh, life events all the time. It's a very simple analogy. Jesus is simply talking about eating his words. When you eat the bread, you're eating his words. You're swallowing his words. You're ingesting the words of Jesus. It simply means that you believe his words. We use that same expression all the time, only we use it in a negative way. We say, did you swallow what he said? When somebody swallows what somebody else says, it simply means they believe what he said. But we usually mean it negatively, that this guy is trying to sell the Brooklyn Bridge, and the guy swallowed his story. We use the term negatively. But as Jesus is using it, it's entirely positive. To eat the bread simply means to swallow his words, to ingest his words, to believe what he says. It means, are you buying what Jesus is saying? Do you believe it? For example, Jesus declared the entire world spiritually lost, spiritually dead, in sin, headed for an eternity in hell without Christ, desperately in need of a Savior. The question is, will I believe that or not? 1 John 1 10 says, if we say we have not sinned, we make God to be a liar and his word is not in us. I don't believe that. It means I don't swallow it. It means I don't ingest it. It means I don't believe it. 
So here's the first mark of a true disciple. They believe the words of Jesus. And by extension, they believe the entire word of God. That's the first mark of a real disciple. Second mark of a real disciple is that real disciples embrace the cross. Look at verse 51. The bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. So now Jesus is switching the analogy slightly. I'm going to give this bread for the life of the world. What's that sound like? John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever would believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. In John 3.16 giving his only begotten son is a reference to the cross. It's a reference to Jesus' crucifixion, to his death. He's talking about the cross here. And the crowd doesn't get it. Look at verse 52. Then the Jews disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So then Jesus spells it out, verse 53. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood. You see, now He's referencing the cross. He's referencing the crucifixion. He's referencing His death. You have no life in you. Verse 54. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 55. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Verse 56. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood, abides in me and I in him. Well, what's he talking about? He's talking about identifying with Jesus in his death and in the cross. Jesus bids his disciples come and die. Jesus said, if anybody wants to follow me, let him take up his cross daily, deny himself and follow me. The cross was very clearly meant death to any of his listeners of that culture. Everybody knew what a cross meant in that culture. A cross meant death. So when Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you've got to take up your own cross, that means you've got to come and die. The Apostle Paul understood that. He said, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. What does that mean? Well, that means when you come to Christ, you die to your own small ambitions. You die to your own wants. You die to your own self-centeredness. You die to your own self-serving motives. You die to your own sinful lusts. And you now live to please and honor and glorify Christ because you cannot honor Christ until you get you out of the way. And the way to get you out of the way is to come and die. But false disciples can't handle that. In fact, even true disciples have trouble with the cross. When, when Jesus asked, who do men say that I am in Matthew 16? The apostle Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Marvelous expression of the identity of Christ. And Jesus says, well done, Peter. Flesh and blood did not reveal that unto you, but my father who is in heaven. In other words, Peter, the only way that you could understand that, the only way you could accept that, the only way you could believe that, is if you got help from my Heavenly Father. And that's the only way any person in the world can accept the identity of Jesus Christ with God the Father's help. But then, Jesus goes on to say to Peter, I'm going up to Jerusalem to suffer and then to die on a cross. And Peter pulls him aside and says, Lord, you're discouraging everybody. Stop talking about death and the cross. You remember what Jesus said to Peter? Get 
behind me, Satan. Wow, one minute Peter is under the inspiration of the Father to speak the identity of Jesus, and in the next breath, he's being influenced by Satan. Such is the way of life in this world in which we live. One minute, we can be in the very presence of the Lord, worshiping His presence, just like we've done this morning, and we can walk out of here, and we can become under the influence of Satan, just like that. This is why false disciples who come to Jesus because of the crowd, because of the sensational, because of their own agenda, and to just because they want to get their needs met, or because they think that Jesus wants to take away all of their problems and let them live a life of happiness. <coughs> That's why false disciples defect when they hear about the cross. When they hear a message, come and die. False disciples don't want that. By the way, the cross is the greatest source of encouragement and strength when you get discouraged. Where do you get that? Hebrews 12, 3. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful man, the cross, so that you will not grow weary and lose hope. The cross, Jesus' death on the cross was infinitely greater than any pain, any rejection, any despising that you have ever experienced in your life. And He understands your pain. He understands what you're going through. And He wants to help you. But you have to be willing to come and die. That's the deal. Number three, real disciples love the Word. Real disciples believe the words of Christ. Real disciples embrace the cross. And third, real disciples love the Word. Look at verse 57. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me Remember, whoever feeds on my words, he also will live because of me. Verse 58, this is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers had and died. Whoever feeds on this bread, my words, will live forever. Well, how do you do that? How do you feed on the bread of life? Well, by feeding on his word. Look at verse 63. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. The words of Christ are the bread of life. You feed on Jesus by feeding on his words and by feeding on the words of this book, the word of God. I said at the beginning that it's the words of Jesus that caused Jesus to be crucified. It wasn't his works. In fact, his enemies wanted to see more of his works. The works were not offensive. They just weren't convincing. They wanted to see more miracles, not less. But they wanted to hear less words. More works, less words. If Jesus' words were what caused his death, then it's also His words that give us life. Look at verse 60. They said, This is a hard saying. See, it's His words. Who's able to listen to this? His words are hard to take. They're hard to swallow. They're hard to listen to. For a false disciple, a false disciple cannot swallow Jesus' words. But they're loved by a real disciple. It's Jesus' words that got him killed. It's Jesus' words that were hated by his enemies. It's his words that are loved by true followers. It's his words that we feed on. 
You go back to John chapter 5 and you can easily see that it's His words that matter. John 5 verse 18, for example, this was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill Jesus because not only was He breaking the law of the Sabbath, but He was even calling God His own Father. See, it's the words that get Him into trouble. He's making Himself equal with God. Verse 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Verse 25, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Even the dead respond to Jesus' words. Verse 28, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who were in the tombs are going to hear his voice, even at the resurrection. It's his words that dead people are going to hear, and it's his words that are going to raise people from the dead. Verse 47, but if you do not believe Moses' writings, how will you believe my words? Back to John chapter 6, verse 59. You see the emphasis on his words again. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught. His words at Capernaum. It's Jesus' words that real disciples love. And you can broaden that to a love for all of Scripture, because all of Scripture is God's Word. And Jesus said, I have come to fulfill the law and the prophets. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He's talking about the Old Testament Scriptures, because at Jesus' time, the New Testament Scriptures hadn't been written yet. He's talking about the Old Testament. Jeremiah says the same thing in Jeremiah 15, 16. Your words were found, and I ate them, and your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart, for I am called by your name, O Lord, God of hosts. That's why Psalm 119 says, I love your word, I delight in your word, I stand in awe of your word. Real disciples love the word, and they read it, and they... They study it like good workmen, the Apostle Paul says, to show ourselves approved unto God, rightly dividing the Word of God. And when you love it, then you obey it. That's what produces transformation. That's the only measurable evidence that you're saved. Life transformation transform life. A person who says, I believe in Jesus, but there's no life change. It's, well, it's mere words. True belief will always produce life transformation. Attitudes will begin to change. The words that come out of your mouth begin to change. Your actions begin to change. <clears throat> Your goals, your life goals will begin to change. Your aspirations of life will begin to change. What you care about most will begin to change. The way you treat people will begin to change. Your integrity will change. Look at verse 60. When many of his disciples heard this, heard this, heard his words, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to this? In other words, they cover their ears. They don't want to hear it. It's too offensive. A lot of people like that today. By the way, everybody will either hear the words of Jesus and respond to them today, or they will hear them later. Look at verse 28. Do not marvel at this. An hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs, in other words, every dead person, is going to hear his voice and come forth. Everybody's going to hear the voice of Jesus. Just a question of whether you hear it now or whether you hear it later. Everybody who hear is going to hear his voice and they're going to come out of the tombs. They're going to come back from the dead. Those who did good to the resurrection of life and those who committed evil to a resurrection of judgment. Those who did good means those who heard the word of Jesus and responded. 
those who did evil or those who rejected the word of Jesus. Everybody's going to one day hear the word of Jesus. Just a question whether we hear it now or whether we hear it later. The words of Jesus are unmistakably clear. You'll either bid him now or you'll bid him later. So let's pick up the rest of the marks of a real disciple next Sunday morning. Let's bow for prayer. Father, thank you for your great love, for your sovereign power, your creative works. And you did it all because of your great love for us. Thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, thank you for your perfect life, your virgin birth, your love, your miracles, your death, burial, and resurrection. That you were God in a human body. And that you have been praying for the church for the past 2,000 years. Lord, help us to be true disciples, to believe resolutely, to believe in such a way that our life reflects our language and our profession reflects our possession of Christ and your Holy Spirit. Lord, if there is one person here today who does not know Christ, who has not believed in Christ, may they bow before you today and honor you as king. May they believe in Christ, be saved and be baptized in Christ's wonderful name we pray. Amen.